Welcome back. Today we are going to look at uh, lesson number two, which is limit of a function and limit laws. My first question is, what is a limit? Well, simply put, it's behavior near a point. Suppose we are interested in how a function behaves near a point x0, but not right at x0. Sometimes we cannot directly evaluate the function at the point, but we can still examine the behavior of the function nearby, thereby finding the limit. Let's examine three functions. All have limits equal to two as x approaches one, but yet the functions look very different. I'm gonna hit pause and draw a sketch here. Okay, for starters, let's take a look at this f of x function. I'm circling it in blue here. So you'll notice that this f of x function is rational, okay? Now you'll notice, as I'm coming in towards one from the left, you know, the functional values are approaching two. So I'm coming in towards 1 from the right, the functional values are approaching 2. But there's a hole at 1. And you're probably remembering from college algebra or, or pre-calc or something like that, if you factor the top of this, it's a rational function, so if you factor the top into x plus 1 and x minus 1, and the bottom has an x minus 1, you know a common factor cancels. So that's why that hole, note to self, that's why that hole's occurring at 1. So even though the functional value does not actually exist there, there's still a limit. So, you know, this picture of f of, s, f of x here has um, a limit equal to 2 as x approaches 1. Now I'm going to circle g of x. g of x is a piecewise function. And, you know, for all x not equal to 1, we have here, so it looks kind of the same as f of x, but then we actually have a point, a value of a function, um, value of a function is 1 when x equals 1. So even though the functional value is different, um, is not 2, basically, the limit is still 2. So as I'm coming in towards 1 from the left, functional values are approaching 2. Coming in towards 1 from the right, functional values are approaching 2. So, the, so what I'm getting at is even though there's a hole there and the functional value is different, there's still a limit. Okay, um, and then h of x we see down here. h of x in orange is here is is the uh, is a linear function. h of x equals x plus one. Well, that one has a value when x is equal to one. You know, y is equal to two, so it has a functional value at two of two, and it also has a limit of two. And that means it's continuous at x equals 1. We'll talk about continuity in the future. So things I want you to recognize is that um, all have limits equal to 2 as x approaches 1, but they don't all have the same functional value at x equals 1. Only h of x has a functional value um, and a limit the same at x equals 1, and hence it's continuous. So only this one right here is continuous. We'll talk about that in the future. Okay? Um, Right, let's see what's next on the agenda. Next, I'd like to take a look at some functions that do not have a limit near a certain point. Here, we're going to look as x approaches 0. And let's just talk about why. So not every function has a limit. Let's see if I can highlight here. So in this first one, this is a step function, uh, sometimes called a piecewise function. Uh, you know, as you're coming in towards 0 from the left, <coughs> your functional values are at 0. As you're coming in towards 0 from the right, the functional values are at 1. Later, we're going to say the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. The limit from the left and the limit from the right are different values, so the overall limit does not exist. Here, on this one, is still a, a step function, <clears throat> but we see some sort of hyperbolic nature there. As I'm coming in towards 0 from the left, my functional values are plummeting to negative infinity. Coming in towards zero from the right, functional values are raising to positive infinity, and then uh, the value right at zero is zero. So uh, not only is it discontinuous, the, the limit as x approaches zero, it does not exist. And then this last one here is oscillating. Um, this last function here is oscillating. So as you're, as you're coming in towards zero from the right, uh, you can see that... Uh, 
it's bouncing, it's bouncing, bouncing, bouncing back and forth between negative one and one. And at any point in time, you know, those functional values could be at negative one or one, and it's going so fast that uh, we cannot calculate the limit on that one as x approaches zero. Okay. Um, all right, I think we're ready to try some problems and review some limit laws before we actually calculate limits on our own. For time's sake, uh, what I'm going to do is um, briefly refer you to these limit laws before we you know, actually try some problems together. Um, the sum rule basically says the limit as x approaches a constant of f of x plus g of x, let's see if it'll let me write on here, is equal to the limit of one function plus the limit of another, basically. So that, in, in words, that says the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Same here, the difference rule. If you want the limit of the difference between two functions, then you're just going to take the difference in the limits. So here, if you want the limit of a constant times a function, that's the constant times the limit of the function. Here, if you want the limit of two functions times each other, you take their two separate limits and multiply them. So that means, you know, if f of x has a limit of l and if g of x has a limit of m, as x approaches an arbitrary constant, you can multiply l times m to get the limit of their product. Okay? Uh, for the quotient rule, in words, the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits. So the limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x is equal to l over m. It's basically the quotient of their limits. Okay, so I continue talking through those rules. The power rule uh, here basically says that um, the limit of a function raised to a power is the limit L raised to the nth power. So it's like you're taking the, the limit of f of x alone and raising that to the nth power. And here, the root rule, the limit of the nth root of f of x is the nth root of the limit of f of x. So you would just take the limit of f of x and then and root it, okay? If n is even, of course, um, we assume that the radicand is positive. All right, now I wrote here, let's play <laughs> with some practice problems. I'm gonna write those up. Let me hit pause. Okay, for our first example, find the limit as x approaches a constant of x cubed plus four x squared um, minus, oops, that should say minus three, okay? Author wants us to use limit laws, so in the, I took this problem from the book, so the author says to use the limit laws to do so. So the first thing I'm going to do, best thing, you tell me what, I'm, you know, what I did. So I'm going to rewrite the problem as this, and then you basically tell me what limit law I used. Okay. So notice I expanded that as the limit of x cubed plus the limit of 4x squared minus the limit of 3 as x approaches that constant. So really what you're, hopefully you're thinking, this, so note to self, first one we use the sum and difference laws, right? That the, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits, okay? Then then we're going to take that a step further. And you'll notice in my next phase, I'm going to say c cubed plus 4 limit as x approaches the constant of x squared minus the limit as x approaches, well actually, in fact, this last one, I'm just going to say 3, because 3 is a constant. Okay, so what did I use there? Well, notice with this one, I have the limit of a constant times a function, so that's that kx rule if you refer back to there. So the limit of a constant times a function is the constant times the limit. So, uh, and then right at the end, you're noticing that this, uh, you're, well, you're noticing that I just plugged c in there, so that's the power rule. And here, the limit as x approaches c of, of a constant, 3, is just 3 itself. So you're noticing some pattern detection there. So then the final phase, plug that constant into x squared, and so we're going to have c cubed plus 4c squared minus 3. 
Now, if you're looking at that, and you're looking back at the original thinking, wow, it just looks like I, you plugged C into the original polynomial. That's right. So when your original is a polynomial function, it will be easy to evaluate the limit as x approaches C. Okay, so I want to note to self, I'm going to put that over here on the side. So the limit, the original, was the limit as x approaches C of x cubed plus 4x squared minus 3. And like I said, you're noticing that that's a polynomial function, and it looks like you could just store c in there and arrive at this answer very easily. That's true, but what we're going to see as things evolve is, is it's not always that simple. Okay? All right, again, in this next example, the author wants us to find this using limit laws. So the limit as x approaches c. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as x approaches c of x to the fourth plus x squared minus 1 over the limit as x approaches c of x squared plus 5. And, and what, you know, what's allowing me to do that, I always like to think of this as legalities, is that quotient rule for limits. Uh, so the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits. Now you're noticing now that the, the numerator is a polynomial and the denominator is a polynomial. So you're probably inclined to think it's going to be c to the fourth plus c squared minus 1 over c squared plus 5 as your final answer, and that would be right. Okay, let's try another one. In this one, we're going to use the root rule. Okay, so we have the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the square root of something. Well, the root rule says that we could rewrite that as the limit as x approaches negative 2 of that radicand there and you know, then square root it. And then since this here happens to be a polynomial function, we can just sort of input that negative 2. I like to think of it like that. So we'll have the square root. Well, if you put negative 2 in for x, negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 minus 3 is. And like I said, you could write that out. I'll write it out so you can see it. So 16 minus 3 is 13, so we will arrive at the square root of 13. Okay, hope that helps. Now we're going to get a little bit tricky here. Some of the tricks of the trade. Those first couple were fairly easy. Okay, in this next one, we have to find um, the limit as x approaches 1 of this rational uh, expression. Now, students tend to get a little trigger happy and say, yeah, I'm just going to store 1 in there. But you'll quickly notice if you put 1 in the denominator, 1 squared minus 1 is 0. Zero under the line is undefined, right? <laughs> so that poses a problem, right? Zero in the denominator. So uh, a common um, sort of algebraic maneuver that you want to do when you're dealing with a rational function, you want to beware of just simply substituting a value in for x. And you want to try um, reducing and canceling out common factors. So let's just investigate a little bit. The top looks like it factors, right? into x plus 2 and x minus 1. And the bottom, there's a GCF, right, with x squared and x. The GCF is x. You're going to factor that out. You're going to be left with x minus 1. You can cancel those common factors. Move to self, cancel common factor. What are you left with? You're left with x plus 2 over x. Aha! And now, okay, now we can take the limit as x approaches 1 of that expression, so of that cleaned up expression. Um, so if you store 1 directly into that, you know, 1 plus 2 is 3, so you, you know, you're going to have 3 over 1, which is 3. So big note to self, you know, beware of directly substituting into the original. You sometimes want to, note to self, reduce first. Okay? All right, let's try another tricky one. Okay, in this next example, we want to find the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x equals square root of x squared plus 100 minus 10 over x squared. I have a big note to self. Beware of using the calculator only. A lot of people try and use the calculator and see what happens. Watch what happens if we do this. Okay, so you'll see I type the function in the TI-83, okay? If I hit zoom 6, 
the standard window. This is a good sort of thing to know from algebra. I don't see anything, right? So then if zoom 6 doesn't work, then I always try zoom fit. <clears throat> and if zoom fit doesn't work, then I try to make my own window to see the graph. Okay? Aha, uh -huh. now at least I see something. Now I want to know the limit as x approaches 0, right? So one way to do that, I love the feature, we go to table set, we keep it on ask, right? We go second table. Now I'm going to clear out whatever I have in there. We're looking for the limit, um, let me clear those out, we're looking for the limit as x approaches 0. So I'm going to put in a number near 0, say 0.01. Calculator spits out 0.05. So I say, okay, how about 0.001? Now, it still says 0.05, so I'm thinking maybe the limit's 0.05. Now I try on the other side of 0, negative 0.001. So I go near, remember we're examining the behavior near a point? Still looks like 0.05. Now I try 0.0001. Still says 0.05. Now I try 0.0001. It says zero. So you say to yourself, oh, okay, maybe the limit's zero. So the question is, is the limit zero or is it 0.05? So some people, they think, oh, you know, we tried the smaller one and it gave zero, so maybe that's the right answer. The right answer is to use your analytical skills. Do not rely on the calculator. So let me shrink that down, but meaning let's actually do this. And there's a very important algebraic maneuver that we need to be able to do this. So f of x is equal to root x squared plus 100 um, minus 10. This is going to require using the conjugate to clean this thing up over x squared, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate to rationalize the numerator. Now hopefully you're remembering that the conjugate of this radical expression would be root x squared plus 100 uh, plus 10. So this was minus 10, this is plus 10. Okay, whatever you do to the top, you got to do to the bottom to keep it legal, right? So we multiply top and bottom by this conjugate. This is going to involve FOIL. Maybe it's been a while since you FOILed. Good old first outer inner last. Okay, the square root times itself makes the square root go away. <laughs> So we'll have x squared plus 100. Then uh, the outer product will be 10, you know, root x squared plus 100. The inner product will be negative 10, you know, root x squared plus 100. But that's obviously going to cancel. Last, you know, negative 10 times positive 10 is negative 100. Okay, all over. And remember, our goal is to look at the limit as x approaches 0 once we've cleaned this thing up. Now the bottom, I'm just going to take the x squared times this. I'm just going to write it out. x squared times root x squared plus 100, you know, plus 10. I'm just going to write it. Now I'll notice the negative 100 and the 100 cancel. So I'm left with x squared on top of x squared times this quantity. Well, hey! Those x squareds are going to cancel out. So after all that sweat equity, um, I arrive at 1 over this quantity. Well, let's explore. So after all that sweat equity, we arrive at 1 over root x squared plus 100 plus 10. And we want the limit as x approaches 0. So big note to self, is it safe yet? <laughs> so now it's safe to put 0 in the denominator because we hopefully won't get 0 in the entire denominator of the expression. Let's go ahead and store 0 in. Uh, 0 squared is 0, plus 100 is 100. Square root of 100 is 10. 10 plus 10 is 20. Aha! We're arriving at 1 over 20, which is guess what? 0.05. So 0.05 was the answer. Remember we were trying to guess, if I go back to the calculator, remember we were trying to guess whether the limit was going to be 0.05 or 0, so now we see 0.05 was the right answer. Okay, hope that helps. So those are two very common algebraic maneuvers, rationalizing the 
numerator or denominator of an expression and uh, using the conjugate. Good luck.